Let's talk a little more about the NVIDIA launch. Every product launch sparks controversy, and I found myself in the crosshairs of more than one faction in the past. I'm not afraid to put myself between some huge debate. Everyone remembers this video right here, right? So in short, I'm not afraid to speak my mind, and I'm not afraid to call BS when I see it. When something smells fishy, I'll tell ya it smells fishy, even if it hurts your feelings. I'm not in the business of keeping people happy. It's how I've approached every product review on the channel to date, and nothing about that will ever change here. But what I find the most interesting about the NVIDIA launch is not how the company actually presented or launched the product. I thought it was pretty weird and I definitely called it out right when I saw it. But more so was how flip-flopped the defense was this time around. I was attacked by a totally different fan base last year and defended by many of those who were actually pretty quick to attack me this time around over my thoughts regarding NVIDIA. Funny how things work. But a vast majority of you actually agreed that the NVIDIA launch was fishy and this is actually pretty good news, at least from my perspective, because it's not that you agreed with me. I mean, my opinion could be totally wrong here and then I'll eat crow and that's fine. I'll be happy to do that. But you guys recognize the change. You recognize the shift in the forwardness of Pascal and Maxwell presentations and how it wasn't so this time around. I was amped about the Pascal launch. I made so many videos regarding architecture and lead performance evaluations and it was pretty easy. Design changes on a core level were pretty predictable. But this time it's totally different and that's what I want to clear up today. If you're still looking for an all-around excellent headset, the Sennheiser PC37X has you covered. Excellent microphone, incredible sound as always from Sennheiser products, and a price that won't break the bank. Check the link in the video description for more details. Turing graphics cards are packed dense with features, most of which we've never seen before. Terms ray tracing and tensor core were thrown out quite a bit during the Gamescom keynote to a group of mostly gamers, albeit a lot of reviewers and you know editors were there as well, but the layman has no idea what any of these terms mean, and that's why these videos right here exist, because I had to learn them just like you did. I mean, a lot of these terms NVIDIA is either recycling or completely making up, and we kind of just have to roll with it. Like 78 RTX ops, that tells us absolutely nothing about the product, because that metric was literally made up by NVIDIA for the launch. So what about other terms, right? Can we throw those around? How about floating point performance? T-flops represent the number of floating point operations, essentially basic math math problems a given GPU can solve per second. They're pretty good at these because they can parallelize like a boss. They have thousands of cores typically. It's a raw number and doesn't translate seamlessly to FPS or any layman metric, but it gives us an idea of theoretical processing limits. Think of it like a car's horsepower metric. It doesn't always translate linearly with zero to 60 times, but people understand zero to 60 times and FPS is kind of the same way. You can visualize those things. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Sure, having a 700 horsepower beast is pretty awesome, but several other factors should be considered if you want to accurately determine acceleration from zero. Weight, tires, drivetrain, and these correspond figuratively to like memory bandwidth, clock speed, API optimization, drivers, and whatever else you can throw into this mix. These aren't cut and dry measurements, and that's why a lot of us steer clear of floating point performance when gauging actual FPS performance, or whatever you want to call it. However, to paint a broad picture here, we'll compare the 1080 Ti's potential with that of the 2080 Ti's, the card with which we'll spend the most time in this video. So, Nvidia spec the 2080 Ti at roughly 13.4 teraflops. The 1080 Ti's was just over 11. Now to prove an earlier point, Vega 64 sported a teflop value of roughly 12.7, placing it just over the 1080 Ti on a raw scale, though we all know how frame rates played out for the red team. In this regard, several other variables played a huge role here, including optimization. That was a huge one, driver support, other things that we're still working on. The 1080 Ti was everything that the you know 4K gamer wanted in a top tier graphics card. At roughly six to 700 USD, it absolutely crushed everything in its path and became, in my opinion, the first true 4K capable graphics card, handling a blistering 8.3 million pixels every 17 or so milliseconds in modern AAA titles with liberal presets. What more could we ask for in a single card for that price? Many still question whether an upgrade from a 1080 Ti is justified, given the vagueness of the latest keynote, and I cannot blame you one bit. In short, if you're already satisfied with your current performance in game settings and gaming resolution, upgrading makes zero sense. 
More money for likely marginal gains and cool looking shadows, right? Yeah, doesn't make sense in my book, but there's more to this that many of you haven't thought about that honestly I haven't either. The 2080 Ti has packed 4,352 CUDA cores, 18.6 billion transistors, discrete tensor and RT cores into an enormous die. Memory bandwidth is blazing fast and TDP over its 1080 Ti predecessor jumped by a mere 10 watts. These margins aren't incredible when seen in the context of Pascal improvements, but the inclusion of Tensor and RT cores, of which we know basically nothing at this point since NVIDIA's kept them on the DL, leaves the end result kind of unknown. But sources similar to those responsible for accurate RTX leaks have apparently released the Turing T102 block diagram, of which the 2080 Ti will be a derivative. Comparing this to the GP102s, we can see the vast disparity in SMs. This time around, we're seeing more streaming processors with fewer CUDA cores in each. The 2080 Ti will boast 68 SMs as the cutdown sibling, with an additional 544 tensor cores and 68 RT cores. NVIDIA has already publicized the CUDA core count of the 2080 Ti, so this math is pretty straightforward. Another leaked slide reveals relative shader performance, this time with an actually labeled Y-axis, and <laughs> that's what I want to discuss next. NVIDIA's ridiculous slides released earlier this week. Can someone translate this for me? I mean, no Y-axis label, no in-game specs detailed, and a title that seems to double down on this claim. Take all of this with a barrel full of salt, folks. Ignoring the deep learning super sampling benchmark, which the 1080 Ti clearly can't can't handle well thanks to its lack of tensor and RT cores, that would be an unfair comparison, we see uh, performance? I mean, things hone in at around 1.5x, but we have absolutely no idea what 1.5x means. Shader performance, as with the leaked slide shown earlier, I mean, even this metric is pretty vague. NVIDIA is steering clear of FPS here, save this one published slide. Now, I have my own issues with the way in which this one was presented, but I'll take what I can at face value and elaborate as much as I can, I mean, given what we have here. Also note that this graphics card is the RTX 2080, not the 2080 Ti. 4K HDR in general cripples the 1080 Ti across the board by roughly 10%, so expect a near 10% FPS cut with HDR enabled versus disabled. Seriously, any benefit NVIDIA can give these new cards, they'll give. So I decided to compare these with my own 1080 Ti benchmarks. I used an i5-8600K from Intel running at 4.8 GHz, nothing overkill at all here, 16 gigs of DDR4, and a 2 terabyte hard drive. This is a typical gamer setup, so page filing, mild overclocking, and modest memory timings will all play a role. I'm also assuming these titles were all tested and averaged in their ultra presets since I achieve higher FPS than these here when 4K settings were dropped, and I seriously doubt that these new cards perform worse in modern games, even given premature drivers. So F1 2017 in the ultra preset, Battlefield 1 at ultra, Hitman in ultra, you get the point. I tested four titles to get the point across, and I got these results here. If we factor in an HDR cut of roughly 10%, which I'm sure you could argue against given the circumstances, but I'm giving the benefit of the doubt here, you can see that things aren't really that far apart. In fact, given last year's trends, we'd expect our 1080 Ti to perform on par with a 2070, not a 2080. And this may still be the case, but then there's the pricing argument. How do you justify the same performance jump as the last generation for more money. I mean, some countries have 2080 Ti pre-orders for upwards of 1200 equivalent USD. That's like Titan territory. Still think it's worth pre-ordering? So look, you can argue for these cards any which way you want. It's gonna be pretty obvious if you're on Nvidia's side at this point, and you can keep an open mind, that's fine, but I suggest that you look at this as a skeptic and not as somebody who's gonna be super positive and, and looking forward to such a successful and epic increase in performance. To me, this thing just looks like a powder cake, honestly, and I don't expect that people are going to be that thrilled with the way these cards perform in most of the games they're currently playing. You can call my opinions clickbait, I don't care. You can insult me personally, call me a joker for calling you out on your pettiness, but know this, people are pissed for a reason. Remember the AMD Ryzen 5 video I pointed to earlier? Turns out I was right. The i5 still outperforms R5 CPUs in almost every modern game in existence years after software updates, Windows patches, crippling the blue team even, so that's more of a plus for the red team, right? And biostability releases for higher frequency memory support. The argument for premature drivers, by the way, as the cause is a weak one at best, and the 980 Ti and the 1070 were neck and neck when Pasco launched. I tested both of those cards in, you know, face to face. I've noticed a tiny spread since then. Nvidia wants these cards prepped for game day. I mean, why would they cripple their own cards on a software level or, you know, just launch them prematurely over pushing back the launch date? To me, that seems like a much more plausible option if that was the case. 
And more food for thought, why would they avoid any frame rate comparison of literally any kind? We saw a frame rate of one game during the keynote, but no direct comparison at all. So sure, I could be completely wrong about all of this. A lot of us agree, by the way, I'm not the only one saying this. We could see though, I mean, 50, 60, 70% performance increases, frame rate yields over the last generation. And if that's the case, I'll gladly admit that I was wrong. But do I think that I am? No. And do I think you should pre-order? No. So <laughs> I think that's where the story ends. But if you have something else to add, you can do so by leaving a comment in the comment section below. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate it. Thumbs down for the opposite or if you hate everything about life. You guys can click that red subscribe button if you haven't already. You can join us if you want to be really special about it. And we'll catch you in the next video. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.